Martin, thanks very much for, for taking the time. In your book, you point out that the world has suffered six global significant financial crises since 1980, each one bigger and more globally devastating than the last. And you believe that despite a flurry of new rules and regulations for banking, the global financial system remains extremely fragile. Uh, what's driving that fragility and what should we do about that? Well, I think there are two central aspects to the fragility. The first is that the financial sector that we have developed, that we've become used to, is in, uh, in the core institutions extraordinarily highly lever leveraged. It, it operates now after the excesses of the pre-crisis years with leverage in the range of 25 to 1. So it has very little true loss-bearing capacity. And we hope that they offset this by their intelligent risk management. But of course, if all the institutions use essentially the same risk management models and they all end up with similar sorts of portfolios, they're very exposed ultimately to the same sorts of risks. And if something goes wrong, people who have lent money to them realize they have very little capital and you can recreate panics of the kind we've seen before with extreme speed. In addition to that, we continue to have in very, very high leverage in our economies, not just in the financial sector. The uh, governments, of course, have generally got more indebted as a consequence of the crisis. So we, we continue to have, therefore, a very fragile financial sector and substantial fragility in the whole economy. At the moment, there is an enormous effort underway to increase the capital requirements for banks, uh, but doesn't force banks to fund themselves with equity to a much greater uh, degree than at the present level uh, a major challenge to the traditional banking model. And doesn't that uh, also mean that the banks will be providing a lot less uh, credit to the uh, real economy? Actually, banks haven't been, pro been providing much capital to the real economy. And if you actually look at what the banks have been doing, they've been predominantly been lending to leverage up property assets. Most of it has been uh, collateralized by property, mortgages of various kinds. They have been <coughs> doing very little lending to small and medium scale enterprises, while the, the big corporates are all dependent on the bond market. So actually the link between bank lending and growth is, has become incredibly weak. Indeed, it's one of the biggest problems that we can have such huge expansions of bank balance sheets without actually affecting investment and growth at all. It's a, it's a tremendous problem. The second point I would make is uh, the traditional banking model is not that traditional. Uh, the leverage we're seeing now, 25 to 1, is quite new. It's not the way banks used to run, uh, certainly in the UK and the US, which I know best, it, uh, 60, 70, 80 years ago, they used to have uh, leverage of at most 10 to 1, often even just 5 to 1. So moving to such extreme leverage as we see today where so the, you know, the sound institutions have maybe leverage of 20 to 1 is actually relatively new. So having such undercapitalized banks, in my view, is one of the reasons why they give us so little in terms of growth and development. It's clearly a tremendous adjustment we've got to make, but moving away from the financial sector we have today could be safer and better in terms of providing capital lending to the economy. I was struck by your estimate that in the US, the uh, cumulative uh, present value of the lost GDP due to the Great Recession over the next century will be 17 times the GDP of 2013, quite an amazing number. What will uh, take it to get the developed economies back on the path of strong growth? I think the evidence from the only time we've had anything like this from the 30s um, was that, uh, uh, in this case, of course, the shattering catastrophe of war led to extraordinary reforms in the economy, not exactly a policy proposal, but there were immense changes in the economy, so they became much more dynamic after the uh, Second World War, particularly true in continental Europe, but also elsewhere. Um, there was a backlog of technological innovation to be implemented. That might be true too now. That not as much, but still quite a bit. That might prove helpful. You need, uh, in my view, growth of demand, which will encourage investment, encourage entrepreneurs to think they can take risks, 
and put uh, new businesses in place uh, well beyond just the IT sector, and that will encourage that. I think this is a tremendous opportunity to do what, say, the Americans did in the 50s when they built the highway program to, to do large-scale public infrastructure investment. Well, let's turn to uh, the, uh, the weakest spot probably in the world economy, the Eurozone. You liken it to a bad marriage, but one from which is Im uh, immensely costly to escape. How to turn a bad marriage into a good one? The short run problem, in essence, is, in my view, you need substantial adjustments in competitiveness. There's no doubt about that. And if they're going to be positive sum, there also has to be some process which generates adequate demand in the Eurozone as a whole. The problem in Europe, I would say, is that if we leave aside Spain, which has genuinely done some reforms, in most of the weak uh, countries there's no reform, and there's absolutely no demand growth. So uh, the Eurozone is stagnant in all. Uh, uh, this is even affecting Germany, after all. And the and that is, I think, creating very big political dangers because you get very high unemployment, you are attracting um, populist politics. So my view is the deal has to be reform for demand. The problem is, on the latter, there is no agreement at all. And because there's no agreement on that, there's no agreement on the former either, might not be anyway. So it looks to me like an impasse, and the impasse is very, very frightening. Yeah, and that's why you're also so critical of the German austerity, austerity push. Yes. Um, although, of course, the Germans always make this quick pro quo that you also just made saying, you know, demand increase, but also for, uh, accompanied by reforms. One of the big dilemmas uh, with these structural reforms is they tend to worsen the demand picture for very obvious reasons. They involve uh, compression of real wages, uh, fairly significant compression of real wages, and shifts from wages to profits. In the short run, in economies that aren't growing very well, and you saw this in Germany very, very clearly, the German corporate sector actually stopped investing. It's not that it invested in Germany, it invested mostly outside Germany, but it was very, very profitable. Consumption demand, consumer demand in Germany was rather weak. There were a number of reasons for this, but I think one of the reasons was the shift, the decline in earning shares. Now, if that happens across the Eurozone as a whole, then the Eurozone as a whole will need external demand to pull it. Uh, and I've argued many, many times that the Eurozone as a whole, which is three times as big as Germany on its own, is simply too big to be pulled by external demand. So I think that the policies that Germany followed are only half relevant to the Eurozone. The, the reforms are relevant, but then you have to ask yourself, how do we deal with the demand suppressing effects of these reforms? And this is not a question, in my view, that the German policy making machinery wants to address. I regard the success of the European Union, and therefore the success of the Eurozone, since they're the same thing, as one of the, you know, unbelievably important for the future of the world and the future of Europe, and the future of my country. Yeah. These things really matter. Uh, and the burden of making them work has fallen on Germany. And Germany will, is going to have to make it work. There is no alternative. Well, let's turn finally to the emerging markets. Uh, and they have been quite a bright spot in, in the growth uh, story of the world economy. Um, will that growth in the emerging markets be sufficient to help the overall global economy get back on its track? Well, first of all, there's no doubt without it, we would have been in a complete catastrophe. And it is very, very important that for the first time ever, ever, in the modern economic world, say, say since the Second World War, um, the developed countries hit an enormous crisis, very slow growth. But the emerging countries continue to grow. So it's a real shift in the whole balance of the world economy. However, it now appears that the, the, the extraordinary growth of the emerging world in the late, mid to late 2000s, the first decade, was a bit of an illusion. And th there is now a slowdown occurring. And the slowdown is occurring for a number of reasons. I think, uh, first, um, a number of economies, quite important economies, uh, stopped reforms and, uh, and they still have a very large reform agenda. They still have many, many problems greater than the developed countries. And then in dealing with the crisis, many of them started huge 
um, credit expansions, particularly China, which were not sustainable. So they have some very big, very big challenges ahead. I think particularly true in China as it deals with the aftermath of its huge investment boom and credit boom, getting growth going again in India, reforming Brazil and all the other smaller economies. And are you optimistic that uh, the emerging markets will undertake the reforms that are necessary? It seems to me that in the end, the pressures from below in countries where people have perceived the possibility of living better, uh, those pressures will force the governments to reform. But it can be a long-term process and a lot can go wrong along the way. Very good. Martin, thank you very much for this tour d'horizon. Pleasure.